but I think it's so Studs Terkel, just like all of us, are a mixed bag, but I think he was very important. Um, he has been influential in helping me see some things. Um, he was obviously he's a Democrat. He's an atheist, but he's had he's worked very closely with some very interesting people. I don't know if y'all remember the um, gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. So Mahalia Jackson got a job on the NB on NBC back in the end of the fifties. Okay. And Stud Sterkel, she wanted Stud Sterkel to be her producer. Now, Stud Sterkel had, because of his Democrat leanings and um, outspoken viewpoints, he had gotten his name on McCarthy's red list, uh, you know, as a possible communist sympathizer. He's not a communist, um, obviously, but he had gotten his name on that list. And so NBC didn't want to touch him with a 10-foot pole. Um, and Mahalia Jackson said, well, you know, my can contract is null and void. Studs has been producing my show for years. You know, if you don't, if you don't get Studs, then you're not going to get me. And so NBC hired him and, you know, the Mahalia Jackson show, you know, ran that gospel segment uh, on Sunday mornings there for the next 10 years or whatever. So anyway, he's had a really good, you know, he loved uh, Mahalia, respected her, respected her religious views, even though he didn't agree necessarily with them. So anyway, Studs is a very interesting guy. Um, he has, I think, especially that very, what he was talking about at the very end, that one, um, Older people are invisible to our society. Who, that we as a society um, don't look back. You know, we look forward, we look to the youth, but then, it, you know, we literally take away the very um, history that we're built on and kind of we end up taking away our own standing, right? So we we're building on sinking sand in in a very practical way. But he was talking about, you know, some of the benefits that we take for granted. And that's kind of ties in with with our lesson today is the benefits of working um in a balanced way. I don't know, have any of y'all heard the story of uh i just my my mind just went blank um sorry dave um um financial peace university dave ramsey there it is dave ramsey Dave Ramsey tells a story about how he was in so much debt and, you know, fa facing so much struggles. He literally was working 100 to 110 hours every week. And he managed to pull himself out. You know, he published a few books. And now he goes around and tells everybody else how to, you know, how to manage your finances, how to be, you know, in the, in, you know, how to, not go into debt and how if you're in debt how to get it paid off in a timely manner and things like that very important information right um but you see this this kind of financially you have this uphill battle in order to get to a place where you can have some comfortable living all right so um while you know in this lecture i'm i'm promoting 
um, the importance of a healthy work to rest lifestyle, right? Um, a healthy v variety of options. Let me read the introduction here to our chapter. It says, you may ask yourself, how do I balance my workload between school, work, and family? Or leisure, or, you know, whatever. How can I find the time to meet up with my friends this week, or this weekend? Or, I have an exam in two days, but I'm working late night tonight and late tomorrow, so when can I squeeze in the time to study? You know, these questions about how to balance our time, how to prioritize our time, how to use time effectively, you know, everybody has the same 24 hours a day. Some people say, oh, I don't have time. You have as, exactly as much time as Bill Gates has, right? He has 24 hours in his every day, and he has seven days in his every week. It's what you do in, in those days and what you prioritize and what you think is important and how you work during those times, that makes a difference. I think if we can get a hold of that point, we all have, and this is something that I've struggled with, I, I still struggle with um, uh, prioritizing, and I think it's just part of the human experience, right? We live in time. We, we're not um, superhuman yet. We're not spirits that can exist out of time. And so we have to live within the confines of time let me say something else. We have to live within the confines of our bodies needing food and our bodies needing rest. If we try to ignore those two things, rest, food, time, space, right? Um, you know, we can't be in two places at the same time. So it's going to take us time to move from one space to another. All these factors have to come together. In order for us, um, and so we have to think through these uh, these issues, um, especially when it has to do with our career. Me and my brother were talking recently. Um, he uh, went off to college, um, almost got done, came back to Mississippi, finally went to USM and finished. Went ahead and got his master's, one extra year, got his master's. And then he went back to Virginia. That's what he had fallen in love with. He went back to um, the Ar um, to Arlington area of Virginia, North North Virginia, D.C. area, and got a job and ended up doing pretty well for himself, actually. But Virginia is one, uh, Arlington is one of the, the most expensive places in the nation to live, probably after New York or LA or something like that. So, you know, you um, he, he's trying. He was trying to make these decisions. Um, it, he was, you know, working in the Pentagon, uh, or at least a couple of days a week, a uh, month. Sorry, he was in, in the National Guard, and so he would go and drill and work in the Pentagon and work with some of the um, Department of Defense contractors. And if you're living out so that you can live in a cheap house, but then you're spending two and a half to three hours a day in traffic just to get to work and back, you're losing that time. Well, it, it potentially, right? Um, some people choose that lifestyle and they use that time to do many things, right? They choose to use public transportation, like they'll use trains. And so they'll sit on the train, they'll write their email, they'll catch up on their reading, you know, and they'll they'll make that their personal time, right? They'll make that their de-stress time um, on the on the commute on the train coming in. Um, but you have to figure out, right, all these complexities that put pressure on us as humans and balancing them out. Um, so finding a, a good, um, life work balance, I think is important. The other thing is, um, uh, I think me and Trakevius were talking about this. Um, you don't want to work in a job that is drudgery. 
that's understandable, right? You want to do something that is fun, exciting, that you don't hate going to work. However, again, under the curse, under sin, um, work ha is inherently drudgery. Actually, this goes back to Stud Sturkle. Stud Sturkle wrote a book, one of the biggest collections of interviews of your average working class people. It's called Working. That's the name of the book. 900 interviews of working class people. And, you know, people are honest there. You know, work is work. It's hard. It's tough. Um, most people don't have the luxury to do whatever they want to do. And yet, you can still find purpose. You can still find meaning in your um, in the work that you do, right? So you're going to have to decide. Um, one, find meaning in what you're doing, or else find something else to do. Two, that you're going to have to be okay with some amount of drudgery. Because uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, one of the most meaningful things is your family. And for us, we have to figure out a way to take care of our family, right? We have to be able to um, make the kind of money in order to, you know, pay for the kids' schoolings and put braces on their teeth and, you know, buy that new... Um, that new living room sectional that your wife wants, those kinds of things are important, you know, for quality of life, you know? So even though you, there's always going to be this trade off between doing what you don't like versus doing what you do like, um, you know, and honestly, the Lord has to, to, to help us find that balance, but look for that balance. Think of it, think it through um decide what you're willing to give up and what your priorities are so i think that's one of the main things um that uh that deciding how to work is important is, is um forces us to do is decide what our priorities are right um just like you can't be in two places at the same time, the same uh, this these are physical principles, right? This is the way God made the world. Can't be two two places at the same time. At the same time, you can't physically two things can't exist in the same space at the same time, right? You have this if you try to put two two objects in space in the same space at the same time, what happens? They're going to clash. They're going to crash. They're going to bang into each other. And one or the other that's weaker is going to end up broken. I mean, I, I know that sounds funny, but um, that's just physics, right? The same is true. You try to do two things at the same time, you know, you can't do it. Um you have to prioritize. And so saying yes to one thing means you're saying no to a whole bunch of other things. If family is priority, then that means you may have to take a little bit less paying job, but that you can get off early enough to come home and spend time with the family. You may have to stay live in a little bit smaller house or an apartment in order um, in order to live close to work so that you're not spending all that time in commuting. Um, so those are the kinds of balances of work life that are necessary for y'all to make decisions about. That's one of the reasons why um, school prioritizes people staying in, on campus in the dorms, right? Um, school is one of the best places where you can where you can have an efficiency of time, but usually pe people um, end up kind of wasting that whole uh, opportunity that they have. Right? They literally um, live 
a five minute walk from where they're studying, right? They have access to the, to the library three more minutes away and they have access to food that's handed to them on a, pl on a platter two minutes away. So they're not um, doing any food prep, um, any preparation for, for home. Um, and so they can literally spend all this time um, focusing on their studies. But obviously, um, you have to be able to pay for that, right? Um, and so there's this trade-off um, for that convenience, for that opportunity. Um, I take advantage of the cafeteria because um, it's, it's a convenience, right? I can walk in and get a hot lunch and sit down and eat and, and not spend time um, on, in food preparation. Now, whenever I'm home, whenever I'm home with the family, then food preparation is a, you know, is a group effort, and, we, and that's part of our family time, right? We may um, plan special meals. And where we all cook together and we all prepare together and then we all sit down and then we all, um, you know, celebrate. So those are, there's the, that. But you see how the trade-off is that if it's just work, um, you know, efficiency. Be as efficient as you can. Eliminate other things so that you can, um, you know, you, 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 like I said, you have to eat. You have to be able to keep going. You have to be able to think clearly. You have to have your, um, and there, I mean, unfortunately, there's a, a direct connection, right, between your stomach and your brain. And so eating sufficiently, it gives you a calmer, more focused way of being able to work. And so it's important to keep that in balance as well. And then rest. Um you have to be able to um, rest, let the little gray cells, the little neurons um, take a break so that you can come back and look at the same problem much more relaxed. So you have to find enough, you have to get enough without spending, you know, without wasting all your, all your life just eating or just sleeping or just, you know, um, taking off. And... If you get these other things in, in proper um, efficiency, then you open up more space for the things that you really want to do. Like, I mean, I've worked every kind of job from riding the back of a, uh, of a garbage truck, right, to working construction, painting, um, laying brick, um, you know, you, you name it. I've done all kinds of different things. Uh, but the ultimate goal was, whenever I was working construction, actually, I would contract out for like one, two, or three days at a time. Of course, I mean, I so I didn't have stability, but I didn't feel like I needed stability. My free time was much more important to me, being able to do um, different missionary projects. So I could literally support myself working two days a week, maybe three days a week, and um, spend all my time in, in missional stuff. And I was doing this like when I was 19, 20, 21. So I could go, um, I, I ate enough, but I ate very simply. I would go to Sam's, I would buy the big 25 pound bag of rice and the big 25 pound bag of beans, um, I would put on my rice cooker and my bean crock pot and, you know, I would take a, I would have, you know, rice and beans for supper and then have some left over for, to take to work the next day. And um, I was, so I was spending a minimum of money, a minimum of, of time getting, a, you know, adequate food and then um, working a couple of days week and then being able to spend all, all my time on you know staying uh linguistics um and missions which was you know my passion when you get married um you have different priorities so you um i whenever my daughter was young 
And me and my wife were both um, in school. I would work nights so that whenever she went to school in the daytime, I could stay home and take care of my daughter during the day. Um, and, you know, you just you have to figure out different scenarios on how to make the, 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 the life and rest and food and all these kind of things um, um, jive. They have to work together. Okay. So um, let me go ahead and share with you my PowerPoint. Imbalance negatively influences communication. So in this scenario, um, <clears throat> let me expand that a little bit where y'all can see what I'm saying, what I'm looking at. Where are you? There we are. Imbalance um, in these areas um, makes us, can make us, you know, irritable on edge and then unable to, to work together to, to really spend the quality time that we want to with the people that we love. Um, balance fosters meaningful relationships. And so being able to, to keep our, our time and our health and our, um, you know, availability, our social life open, um, creates room for meaningful relationships. And I, after all, I think to me that is the most important thing is the relationships that we're building. Okay, so um, you see some people who are extremely driven, who um, have no time to get married have no time for, you know, they will hang out with their, their, you know, with a few friends after work every now and then, but most of the time they're spending, uh, where they're spending time in work and they don't have time for other people and they end up, you know, kind of miserable and actually without any friends. So being able to maintain that balance, I think is, is really important. Boundaries. I, um, as I said before, saying yes to one thing is saying no to everything else, right? So yes and no is creating boundary lines, and you can't say yes to everyone. That's a, that's a physical impossibility, right? It goes against the law of physics. Two things can't exist in the same space at the same time. You can't be in two places at the same time. So you have to respect the laws of physics that apply to us as humans. Um, and then uh, work-life balance, um, we need others. We need our, um, a community. And I, I have come to understand that more and more, um, particularly in terms of a church community, a church family. So in my life, my church family is the most meaningful relationships in my life. They become our family. Um, partly of this is because um, my biological family, we're close, but we have always been like all over the world. My parents have been missionaries. They've been in many different countries. Um, my brothers and sisters live in different towns and, and cities of, of the country. Um, I have a brother who, you know, the last four years he's been in Germany um, working in, in special forces uh, with, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the Army. I have another brother who's, you know, like I said, he worked in D.C. And um, then my sisters, some of them live, you know, 
an hour away, two hours away, three hours away. And so my my church community, the ones I see every week, right, two, three times a week, that is my family, right? We work together. We share our burdens. We share our struggles. We help each other out. Um, all Everything that makes up being a family. And so this community, to me, is the most important thing in my life. And so being able to participate in a community like that. And also, I, I feel like my work is kind of an extension of my existence in, in church, right? Um, my contribution to society is motivated by my religious belief. Um, because I am a Christian, you know, then I believe in serving others and, and particularly serving others in training and teaching and, and preparing people and, and giving them the, the kinds of skills to have the most meaningful life. So I think communication is the best, you know, the best job in the world. I really do. That's why I'm in communication. That's why I teach foreign language, you know, communication in other languages as well as English. Because I think that's the most um, meaningful life in the world. So, but again, there are struggles. There are, tr um, there are, there's a certain amount of, hard work and drudgery that goes into dealing with people, right? People are people. They're very complex. They have many, um, many aspects to them and all their aspects don't always go a hundred percent with my aspects. Right. And so I'm sure people find me also hard to deal with and hard to get along with at times. Um, but in the end it's worth it. Right. So the drudgery um, does not take away from the benefit and the value that I find in this kind of work. Let me read a couple of definitions here from the book. Another term important to this discussion is community, a geographic space identified as a place to work toward a good life. That's interesting. A geographic space. Um, COVID kind of has changed that definition just a little bit, right? A lot of our community spaces are actually virtual spaces, unfortunately, right? We spend more time here looking into the camera. Uh, what did Studs talk about? He's, he's talking about his, his view on computers. He says, you're looking into the screen like you're peeping into other people's lives. And it's almost like a peeping Tom. Um, uh, I'm not saying that he's completely wrong there, but, um, yeah, anyway, it's, it is a less healthy form, but in these cases, it's necessary. It's, it's the form of, of communication, the form of community that we, um, are kind of pushed into because of circumstances. The term community has a number of historical uses. For example, developing a place with boundaries that identifies a neighborhood. So for some people, a neighborhood is a community. Um, whenever I was studying uh, Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Judaism, um, especially Orthodox Jews have very strict rules about um, distance. Like um, you can only walk so far on the Sabbath day, right? I don't remember if it's 200 paces or 150 paces or something like that. Um, 150 paces outside of your home. But Orthodox Jews also kind of made a loophole where all... Uh, like groups of Orthodox Jews would live together in the same communal area, you know, the same houses within a, a short area. And literally there would be a fence around this communal area. And that was their home. So as long as they were walking within the communal area, that didn't count against their, their steps um, on the Sabbath day, right? It was only whenever they stepped outside 
outside the communal area that it could count against the steps on the Sabbath day. So, you know, you could take your kids over to the next door neighbors to stay, um, or y'all could go together um, over to, you know, the next door neighbors to eat, to eat lunch. And um, you're not violating the Sabbath by walking too far. So communities um, create these different rules on how they're going to interact, which is a very interesting concept in itself. Um, also, community marks out who lives inside and who lives outside, right? There's this interdependence of people that you're going to live inside and outside with. Um, and many times it's ideological. So um, I know perhaps y'all have heard the term tribalism. Um, you know, those are our tribe people who we most closely identify with um, usually are where before they were identified with our family group, right? Most people didn't move away from their family group. Um, in our fractured societies, um, many of us don't live near our family group, or at least I've, I'm speaking for myself personally. And I think a lot of people in Hattiesburg, uh, come from many places all over the country and even the world. And so living away from their family group, they have to um, identify a new tribe. Either they identify as Hattiesburgians, right? Or they identify with certain ideologies or certain characteristics, right? Everyone who has red hair, right? The Red Haired League, um, that is their tribe. Or people who walk with, um, you know, with a funny gait or, you know, any number of, of communal definers. To attract the best candidates, companies often talk up the, the community or the culture where the company is located. For example, here's one. Um, and this is from Houston. Um, I, I, me and my family lived and worked in Houston for a couple of years. Here, one company says, most of our employees live in the woodlands, and it's just a short commute from Houston with some nice housing options, great shopping, and excellent schools. The term community is also informative to ethnic minorities, right? People with disabilities, professionals. Uh, people want to work and live in communities where they feel safe and they feel included. Although the topic is defined inconsistently, despite vast scholarly inquiry, work-life balance is the accomplishment of role-related expectations. Here's your sociological definition, all right? The accomplishment of role-related expectations that are negotiated and shared between an individual and his or her role-related partners in the work and family domains. I'm gonna add that here for you real quick. Definition of work-life balance. Judge, um, this is my dirt definition for this round. Accomplishment of role-related expectations that are negotiated and shared between an individual and his or her role related partners in the work and family domains. They put in life domains. And this comes from Jersey Wax. And Carlson.
So this is this is the result of not maintaining a good balance, right? Not eating right, not resting right, not having good um, engaging, purposeful work as well as time away from work, right? All those things being together, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out your your neurons, you're gonna burn out your body. Um, and this overtaxing of nutrients in your body leads, you know, it, it begins to deplete certain aspects in your body. And then that leads to depression, you know, in other words, chemical depression, um, anxiety on, on all kinds of things can be um, the result from keeping these things out of balance. Um, a lot of Studs Turkle in that interview mentioned how, how many people uh, from the early days um, fought for you know, through the labor movement, fought for the, the things that we take for granted as um, benefits of, of work, right? Whether it's um, work hours, right? Whether just, just respecting people as people rather than seeing them as, you know, expendable. Um, from the medieval times, the wealthy landowners had the serfs who lived their land and worked the fields and they would simply collect the taxes of, of food and grain and whatever was grown, right? Which was very, very little more than slavery in itself. Um, the fact that uh, people were expendable and didn't have, you know, the right to their own labor right or to the benefits of their own labor or 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 that other people had rights to their labor is a benefit that we take for granted but today um we live in one of the the most um affluent societies with the most benefits for the worker i'm not saying the most right and there's plenty plenty of problems but living in a, in a time of peace very little war that has directly affected our lives um with a living wage you know where we can actually work and and come home and you know and have decent uh, a decent life um have decent food right um, have decent clothes and decent meaningful relationships. This is a benefit that we can be very thankful for. And companies, in order to promote more effective, I think companies are beginning to realize that in order to to get better results from their labor, from their people, right? If, if, they're, if you're defining labor in terms of people, is to maintain people in, a, in the healthiest condition possible. That's talking about healthy mentally, um, physically. Um, and so giving them time off, giving them uh, decent wages, um, benefits the company because then whenever they come to work, they're going to work more efficiently. They're gonna, their productivity is gonna be higher and everything like that. So from a business standpoint, it makes sense to take care of your um, wages and from an individual standpoint as well. That isn't to say that, um, that, uh, imbalance isn't going to happen here we go employees are happier at work and at home when they have greater control over their working lives they have time to focus more on life outside of work like i love reading 
Um, I think I was talking to some of the kids the other day. I love reading poetry, but I find ways to read poetry kind of around the edges. Five minutes here, 10 minutes there, in the middle of, of, of things. And um, I, so I try to gather up these spare minutes, not to over, not to let those overtake and overshadow everything else, but it gives me those, you know, those five minute vacations between classes, right? Where I, where I am able to refresh my mind through, you know, through things that I have that I've been reading and, and things that I think about. Don't bring problems from home to work, right? Um, loyalty and commitment from the company, right? The company actually shows you that they um, value you and they give you benefits. Improve self-esteem, health, concentration, confidence. Um, relations with management and feel a greater responsibility and sense of ownership, you know, because the job that you're working is meaningful and purposeful. For employers, having a more motivated, productive, and less stressed workforce results in maximized available labor, reduced costs, retaining valued employees, reputation of being an employer of choice, reduced absenteeism, increased productivity, attracting a wider range of candidates, such as older and part-time workers and making employees feel valued. Again, balance is always a struggle, right? It's not a perfectly achievable thing that's gonna happen and, and it's gonna be the rest of your life, right? If you're ever in balance, it's like the person walking on a tightrope across, across the arena at a circus, right? You're never not working on the balance. You're like, oh, I've got this, um, you know, balance in our life, balance of our time, balance of how we use our money um, is always, always something that we're working at. But hopefully, um, I think through focus, through prioritization, through, through putting the most important things where they belong, right? Focusing our time on, on God and his um, understanding what his calling for us is. And then making those ranked um, prioritization structures is going to be the key to keeping the best, um, the best uh, balance possible. And so with that, I'm going to give you one verse that um, will uh, hopefully help you um, And it is, uh, I know many of you probably already know it, but I'm going to type it in here anyway because it's, it's such a powerful verse to me. Here we go. Even the young people. Faint and be weary. And young men will fall exhausted. But they wait on the Lord. Will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. What does an eagle need to stay to mount up? They need balance, right? They literally live and die by the the pressures of physics right the wind under the wings the the tuning the finely tuning of the feathers in order for um but at the same time they're not constantly flap flap flapping right they don't have to work hard they just have to stay 
um, in tune with the spirit, with the air around them and keeping in that balance. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. There you go. Isaiah 41, uh, sorry, 40, 30 to 31. Y'all have a great Monday afternoon. Be ready with your presentations on Wednesday. We also have um, team meetings on Wednesday. And y'all go have a great Monday evening. Take time off. Good night. You are currently the only person in this conference.